All right. Well, after that long delay. Hi, guys. So I'm Jesse Pellant, and uh, I am managing partner of Studio IP, and we're an all IP law firm. So we handle everything that deals with trademarks, copyrights, patents, and then all the business agreements that go with it, and then all the litigation that comes out of that as well. So because of all of that, right, I feel like we're, we're dealing here with just this great introduction to what intellectual property is, what those things mean, and how they kind of apply to you know everyday situations, different business situations and things like that, and how to recognize them, and then how to protect them and why. So I think the biggest thing that I always like to start with is the why, right? Like, why do we really care about intellectual property and what that encompasses? Because I feel like there's so many times in daily life, right, when we can be noticing and identifying intellectual property that we don't actually think about it. So here's here's a couple of my thoughts, right? In music, we want to make sure that we're not using someone else's lyrics and or some lines. So the, the famous the famous song, right, Under Pressure from Queen. I don't know if you guys remember this case or not, right? So Ice Ice Baby from Vanilla Ice was one of like the legendary cases, you know, and if everything was perfect in this world, right, we would have had that playing as you guys came into the room. But the point being, you know, that do 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 that one line was enough. I mean, he straight up stole that, Vanilla Ice did, from that Queen song and had it placed into his song. And then he ended up having to pay royalties. The case settled out of court, right? They didn't actually go to court on it. But it's, it's interesting just in terms of, oh, you hear something and you love it. And then you riff off of that, right? Well, there's credit is due. And the license needed to be paid um, back to David Bowie and Queen on that one. So anyway, that's one, one particular instance. But websites, photos, images, you know, we're always building websites, right? It seems like every day now people are, are trying to make a new, you know, business website, their personal site, something like that. They need a cool new image. They need this image here. That It's no longer clip art, right? Like we're going to the internet. We're Googling an image. We're trying to pull a really cool picture. Well, unless you're paying, you know, some kind of a license fee, for these images, the chances are somebody probably owns the rights to the image that you are putting up on your website. And then we get calls all the time of, you know, I got this random cease and desist letter. Well, now there's bots online that are phishing all websites out there, right? Any content to find their images to make sure that they're being paid the license that they're owed. But then it ends up, you know, you're, you're spending probably two grand to end this issue right then had you just spent the twenty dollars for a license initially so that's another place right that this is coming up constantly and then we've got company or product names obviously with the trademarking and we'll get into all of this in a minute but this is kind of broad scope right big brush strokes and technology what you're creating is this something that is you know you're taking something that already exists and you're creating something brand new or are you you know actually coming up with something that is truly, truly disruptive and inventive and not been used, utilized before at all, right? And if that's the case, then it might be worth protecting. If you're creating that something that's building off of something else, do you owe somebody else a license, right? As you are building off of what they've already began. In art, we talk about fashion, right? Or, or a new, let's say you're creating some kind of a, new piece of artwork that involves photographs of something that already exists or pictures of sculptures, things like that. And in the fashion realm, are you using someone's logo, right? Are we using like NFL logos on baby sleep sacks? Are we, you know, using um, certain new cool designs that you've created that's now on fabric? And is that, that protectable? Um, and software, obviously software is huge, right? Software is, is like, the backbone now of anything that's being created, I feel like. Open source, we're gonna talk about that, right? The open source code and how that comes into play as you are building something new with software. Is this something that has terms of use where you're not allowed to then commercialize what it is that you're creating? That can be a huge problem for you if you're trying to create a product that can then be monetized and commercialized, right? 
So anyway, those are kind of some broad brushstrokes of like, okay, yes, IP comes into play, right? In, in almost every instance, no matter what the type of business is and no matter what you're looking at moving forward in, in life. So it's, it's a fun and interesting topic. And uh, I obviously love what I do um, in terms of this because I get to work with the most brilliant minds like yourselves, right? Uh, people that have ideas and innovators and be on the cutting edge of new technology on a daily basis and either protecting them or helping them create and enforcing their rights, et cetera. So here we talked about this with Ice Ice Baby, but I just love that image. It's pretty brilliant. And we're also gonna talk about digital privacy as well as domains and social media. These are places where now intellectual property is becoming much more at the forefront of the conversation because as people are building a brand, they need to have this social presence in the you know online community, right? In our virtual community. And of course, as soon as COVID hit, it was like, whoo, explosive, right? Everybody needed to be uh, have a virtual identity, right? No matter what kind of business you run or own, you are having to connect with people on a whole new level in a whole new way which means you, you need hashtags, right? You need all these kitschy brand things in order to make yourself stand out. Well, are you stepping on someone else's toes with this new hashtag you've got? Do you have some crazy weird hashtag that's now like, you know, got some weird stuff that's showing up in your feed that you're a little worried about, right? Because that's brand reputation and it's affecting you. And again, this all gets managed through the protection of your intellectual property. All right, so trademarks, we'll start with like, you know, baseline here, real simple stuff, right? The Nike logo, you're talking about a symbol or you're talking about a brand name. The symbols are the logos. Um, you've got slogans, just do it, right? That's obviously a, a pretty, pretty simple one. But the sound of NBC, ding, 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 that's uh, protected as well. Um, colors can be, so Tiffany's blue, that specific eggshell blue is, is a protected color. Um, so is uh, Louboutin shoes. Those are like very fancy, expensive women's heels. And on the, the base part right here, it's always bright red. And, uh, and that's a trademark of theirs as well. The thing about trademarks is that you are limited to the service or product specifically. So if you think about it, Right? You don't, obviously you don't see Nike glasses, right? Unless they actually make like eyewear. Um, but that's because that brand is so large that they have grown to a space where they're famous enough and they have enough like hands and products that they could foreseeably expand into that area. Let's go with something else, right? Like a different type of brand that maybe only focuses on fly fishing gear like fish pond, for instance, they are not going to be moving into, you know, the athletic apparel space, right? They're going to be very specific to what they do. So someone else that might want to come into the space and use fish pond for athletic wear would be able to do that based on the law and how it reads, right? Because you're in separate areas, but there is this gray area, right? This overlapping space that can happen. And that's why it's, it's a good idea to have kind of a, a big, big picture idea of where you want to go in the future so that you, you know when you're doing your search and clearance for brands, right, that you're going to make sure that there's nothing that's even somewhat close to kind of that area that you're going to be in, right, that area of commerce that you're going to be in. There is a sliding scale of distinctiveness that we talk about when we talk about trademarks, okay, and this goes from, you know, are you describing what it is you're doing? Like something paper source is suggestive of what they do, right? You know, that store that you've seen probably on the corner that sells like stationery and cars, right? So paper source, to me, it's pretty distinctive of what they're doing. But uh, as you go right all the way to Google, let's say, and Nike, they are completely made up new words that none of us knew before they existed, right? And that is the sign of a truly exceptional brand because it is something that is brand new, that has the space to be created and they have the most rights around anything that is that distinctive. 
So that's kind of this, this sliding scale that they talk about in terms of your trademarks. So as you, you know, think about branding and it, whether you're working for a company, whether you're creating a company or products, the weirder you can be, the better you're going to be, right? It's, it, it's kind of interesting. It's just the, the more out there you can be with, you know, creating something brand new that has not been heard of before, the better off you're going to be in terms of the protectability of your rights. Search and clearance, we'll talk about what that means, but you always want to be searching to make sure that what you're creating doesn't already exist out there, right? Someone else isn't already using something that's somewhat close to what you're doing. And you'd be surprised, right? Even, gosh, there's, I've got a good example um, of a client recently that came up with kind of like this, you know, real wacky kind of out there brand for these kid backpacks. And they thought, you know, this is going to be great. There's nothing out there that's going to be similar to this. Sure enough, someone's selling these bags, like kind of purses bags on Etsy and reaches out, you know, the second that they're, they're interested in this mark and they're, they're like, yes, that's, that's, that's kind of in our space. That's similar to what we're doing. And, you know, they both came up with this within like two days of each other. So it's kind of crazy to, to really, you know, it does happen, right? So you do want to do some search and clearance and kind of make sure you're, you're clear to use your brand. Social media and the trademarks I touched on, but we'll touch on that again in a minute. But it's, you do have protection over your trademark in any hashtags or anything that's used on social media. So if you have an account, you know, if you've got a handle or something like that, if somebody else starts using that handle or hashtag, and you, you have recourse against them if you own the rights to the trademark. Question. Yeah. How can you prove that you came up with that hashtag? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's two things. There's registered rights and then there's common law rights. So if you have registered rights, there's a date of first use that you actually put into the registration where you're saying, this is when I'm first using this in commerce and I first start my rights on this date. So if somebody else is using it before you, they have rights to it. If you are first, then you have rights to it. In common law, where you don't have a registration to really prove when you first started using it, we tell our clients to document heavily everything that they start you know, using names for. So the company name, any product names, anything like that. You want to be documenting when you're first using it. So, you know, we'll go in and take screenshots of websites and social media sites and things like that to pull first use up when we need to, but it is helpful if the company can kind of be on the forefront of that. And then there's two different types, right? You've got, like we talked about the logo, like the swoosh, and then you've got brand names and that's the design mark versus the word mark. So these were the most valuable brands. Uh, this was as of, let's see, 2021, like January of 2021, um, which is not, you know, you recognize every brand up here, right? It's not surprising. Um, Facebook, suggestive of what they do. Uh, Apple is completely arbitrary because Apple for computers makes zero sense. Coca-Cola was made up, Google was made up, Microsoft was made up, Disney was made up. Amazon, obviously we know the Amazon, but it has nothing to do with what they do, right? So it's also pretty arbitrary, just like the Apple mark. And McDonald's and Samsung and Toyota, all completely made up marks that just didn't, you know, there's a brand that just didn't exist. The, the name didn't exist in our vocabulary until they created them. So it's interesting to see, see that, but I mean, the. I think a lot of times startups and people that are, you know, working in the, the entrepreneur space lose sight of the fact, and I get it because I've been, you know, I'm a business owner too. Like I've been there and you're bootstrapping things and you only have so much money. But the thing is, if you don't brand yourself well initially, right, you're going to start creating goodwill to a brand that may or may not be protectable, may have to change. So at what point are you then going to be losing, right, a lot of your uh, customer base or reputation or some of that goodwill, like you're, you're losing, you know, steam on it because you've got to switch and switch gears. This is just really to show 
how expensive and how worth the money it is at the beginning to, to, to take that time and really protect yourself well because of how much money the brand is worth in the end. And we also do a lot of VC work and a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions. And when you, when you look at the value of a business, right, the intellectual property is going to be where likely most of your assets, your expensive assets are gonna lie for a business. So it's, it's just something to really remember um, as you go forward. Okay, so this gives us that sliding scale I was talking about. And I love this, right? We've got the coined fanciful marks like Kodak and Google, more arbitrary. Apple's a word we've all heard of, right? But not for computers. Suggestive is something that has kind of a component of, of what the, the brand is. So like I said here, it's got Greyhound for bus services, Impala for cars, Caress for body soap. Um, Descriptive, <laughs> the paper company for cards and paper, Computerland, Vision World, right? We obviously know what those are gonna be doing. An interesting component of this that I haven't talked about yet is becoming generic. And that is when it's almost like your brand is so good, now only people call it that specific thing. Xerox was a brand name. Who doesn't say, I'm gonna go Xerox that, right? Um, rarely do we say, I'm gonna go link a copy. It's just, it's interesting. Um, same thing with aspirin, escalator, kitty litter, and Kleenex. Kleenex is one of the famous ones, right? Facial tissue is, is <laughs> not used very often, right? We all say, I'm gonna grab a Kleenex. And it's just because of uh, how good that they are at branding. But if you're that good, you have to be really good at protecting it too because it can become generic. And that's why Google is very forceful in their um, policing of their brand because they want to make sure that no one is using <laughs> Google as a straight up term all the time for search engines. I'm gonna Google that, right? And they, they do, obviously they can't police our daily language, right? That just happens. But it is in terms of what you see online and that type of stuff, because if someone is to then challenge them someday to say, your mark should no longer be protected, we should all be able to say Google, you know, that would obviously be a big problem for them because a lot of their money uh, lay, waits in their brand name. And I should say too, of course, at any time, whether um, you're online or here, if you guys have questions, please stop me and ask them because this is for you and to you know get benefit, the most benefit out of this as you want. So please ask questions as we go up here, if you have them. So these are your considerations, right? In terms of your search and clearance is that either you're wanting to uh, make sure that you're not stepping on someone else's toes and infringe something that already exists. Um, or your end, you're wanting to know, that's like one side of it, and you're wanting to know if you can protect it. Yeah. So uh, I know that if there's two different brands that like have the same name, but they're totally different, mm -hmm. like how does that work? So uh, same brand name, different like products entirely? Yeah, yeah so that's allowed because the trademarks are really specific to whatever industry or product or service that you're selling. And we're gonna go through actually an exercise you guys can search your own uh, trademark or a trademark right now. And, and it'll help a little bit because you can see when we go into the United States Patent and Trademark website, you look at what they call a class system and they list you know, shirts and clothes and hats and stuff are in one class, glassware is in another, sporting equipment is in another, and they do that to try to categorize these products and services separately so that people can exist in their own small, you know, if you think of it, because it is property, right? So if you think of it as like their own small stake of ground that they're able to have, you know, and say, okay, so you have entirely, you know, clothing for this brand name, but that doesn't mean someone can't use it for banking, if that makes sense, because you're very specific to what the service and, and uh, product is. Okay. 
And this is, you know, this is where we're going to do that. So this is perfect timing. So I don't know if you guys have sort of an idea already of like, are you creating a business? Are you not? Do you guys have any kind of a you know, product name or something that you're thinking of? The idea here is that you can either use your computer. We can also um, do it on here as well while we're doing this. I'm just going to exit out of this real quick. So when you go to a web browser, the United States Patent and Trademark Office is USPTO.gov. Okay. Once you're on this main landing page, you go over to trademarks here and we're gonna search because we want to see if whatever new brand name we've come up with, right, is available. So you go over to tests and we're going to search. Here, you come up with a search option box and it's got, you know, basic word search structured and free form. In terms of just understanding that this is, right, something that's available to you to, to utilize, I would say just the free form is pretty much the way to go all day long for you guys. It, it, the others, I'm just, the reason I'm saying that is because you can get nitty gritty with a more advanced search, but that's usually what attorneys are using because we're looking in specific classes. We've got certain codes we're using and things like that. We don't need to worry about that. If you're trying to do a general search to see if something is somewhat available, you wanna just go here to the most broad search possible. And you want to put whatever you're searching in quotation. Okay, so you can decide what name you want to do. I'm going to search Wanderwild. So keep in mind, you know, we talked about how trademarks are only valid, right? We're going to keep you from using this mark in the space where someone else is already using it for some kind of service or some kind of product, right? So here, It looks like there's only two that are specifically wander wild. Here's the other thing about trademarks. Anything that is, oh, substantially similar, right, which is obviously very vague, um, is also going to keep you from using a similar mark, okay? So there's kind of this buffer around every mark as well, every brand, like Nike that might be N-I-K-E -E and E-E, -E, right? So there's two E's. If I were to search right here and I've got Nike with one E only, then Nike with two E's isn't gonna show up for me, right? So it is important often to, to utilize kind of some broader search terms and broad search ideas. But for, for now, we're gonna do this. We're gonna take a look at both of these registrations. And please feel free to take a look at whatever you want to on your home screen if you've got something you want to search and ask me questions about it if you'd like to as well. But here, we've got Wander Wild. You can see where it says goods and services. This IC18 that you see right there, that's international class 18. Like I was telling you how they've categorized Right, certain things. So in class 18 are backpacks, knapsacks, other bags, traveling bags. And then this first use, right? This shows you when it was first used in commerce. So if somebody already has an application out there, right? Or, or a registration and it shows their first use, then you can use that, right? To know whether or not, okay, well, I was using my mark back you know, five, 10 years ago. Uh huh. So when setting up one of these, uh, wouldn't you want this as broad as possible in case you want to go into different fields? Like if Nike, when they're just working on shoes, would they want to trade market an apparel and uh, eyewear? So. Exactly. So the question is that, you know, when you're going to file something, 
would you want to be more broad than what you just have at the time? And the answer is yes, for sure. You want to be as broad as you possibly can, knowing that there's two types of applications. One is that you're already using this mark in commerce, right? Like I basically established my website three years ago. I've been selling my brand shoes, you know, MJ for like the past three years and it's established. So I wanna file an in-use application, but let's say I then wanna move into, you know, shirts and pants and things like that with this new brand that I built three years ago, MJ. Because I wasn't using it on the shirts and pants until now, or I'm not using it yet, let's say, I'm gonna use it in two weeks, right? You wanna file an intent to use application. The intent to use a brand name with a particular service or product within the next three years. So the reason I say within the next three years is because you can only have or hold this application, this spot for that brand name with whatever service or product it is for that particular period of time. So you get a note basically from the United States Patent and Trademark Office every six months that says, hey, are you still gonna use this? And you say, yes, I'm still planning on using it. But basically like, I'm still finding my manufacturer. I'm working on my labeling, right? I'm finding my fabrics. But if you have an idea that within the next three years, you can only do the, those extensions every six months for up to three years. So once that three years is up, you either lose the application or you file a statement of use, your, your attorney does. And that basically says, hey, yes, now I'm gonna be using this, right? I'm using it in commerce. Here's our example, right? Here's a picture of my website. Here's my label on my clothes. Here's a picture of it. And then you have that, that right to use it. Let me go down. I was actually on my way down for a lot. Let me see if he's I thought I just had a question, but I guess not. Okay. All right. A good, great question. Great question. And on here, you can see that there's filing basis. That's what we were just talking about. And that means whether it's in use or not in use. And that can really change, you know, whether or not like your analysis, if somebody files something and has an intent to use it, let's say for, you know, shoes, but I've been using it for shoes for the past three years, you can file to cancel this person's registration because in that scenario, you have the prior rights to use it. So it can be kind of a complicated scenario. You know, what, what I kind of want to get out there and give you guys the tools to do is to be able to get in here, put in a name and see if it's being used by somebody. You know, that gives you at least an upper hand in terms of understanding if you've got the, the ability to use a mark or a brand. And any other information on here is, is helpful. You know, you're looking at the owner, you're looking at the products and services, so you're seeing what kind of area they're in and understanding whether or not you can do that. Do you guys have any other questions about the search? Do you want me to search anything specific? Mm -hmm. Law, L-A-W. <laughs> okay, we had a request to search law. And look at this. No, two weeks. Oh, two weeks. Yes, sir. Yeah little different, right? Yeah. We had like 8,400 results and now we're looking at two. And it's follow the law. This, now when you see that live or dead on the right side there, that tells you whether the registration or application is a lot, has canceled or is live. So this dead one, you don't need to worry about for the most part, usually, because they've let their rights lapse. This live one, You'll see it didn't show a registration number and that's because it's merely an application. So follow the law was applied for and it's been published for opposition. No, it will be published for opposition on June 1st. That means that the examiner has approved this mark to be used 
but now they're just going to wait and they, and they put out to the rest of the world in the trademark publication, which is really only followed by attorneys. <laughs> um, but they put it out there and they say, you know, hey, does anybody have any problems with this, right? Do you think that this affects your rights? And then if it doesn't in the 30 day window, then they will register this mark. So seemingly on June 30th, this mark will be registered. Yeah. Um, can you go through patent search at all? Oh yes, I'm going to. Okay, perfect. Yes, absolutely. Yep, okay. So we're done with trademark searching, are we good? Any questions on that? Okay, I'm gonna reboot up our presentation here. Okay. This is appropriate marking, but we can kind of zoom through this and move on. This basically just, you put a TM behind anything that you don't actually have registered rights on. That's when you're just claiming it as a trademark, but that's like in common law. You put the circle R if it's actually a registered trademark, which is kind of interesting when you go out in the world and you look around and you see a lot of stuff with TM on it. It means that they've applied for, for rights probably, or they're just claiming common law rights because they can't get a registration, which happens too. And we already talked about the different kinds of filing but this will be available as well. I'll have this sent out to anyone that registered for the class. So you guys can take your time and kind of look through this on your own because it's got some interesting information on it. And this is like a fun slide on some of the best infringement cases. Um, Costco won this case. They called this setting the Tiffany setting. And this is one of those perfect examples of becoming too good at your branding uh, because of that, you know, they basically won saying it, it is generic. Everybody calls this particular six prong setting of a ring a Tiffany setting. So Costco won and they were allowed to use that terminology when selling their own version of a Tiffany ring. Pinkberry, Coolberry, you can just see it dumb Starbucks. It's like they didn't do anything different. They just literally put the word dumb in front of it. It's kind of funny. And there's lots of Christian Lebotin cases with those shoes. Okay, now we'll jump into the patent world. And we will also run through a search, so don't worry. But a patent is a form of intellectual property, right? Granting its owner the legal right to exclude others, which is really interesting because copyrights and trademarks, right? You're, you're creating something that, you know, then of course you've got the space to use it in patents, you're keeping other people from doing what you're doing. So we call it a negative right. It's really interesting. You're just excluding others from doing what you're doing. And you're, you're doing that for either 15 or 20 years, depending on if it's design patent or utility patent. And it's, it's a, we'll go over this, this debate in a minute, but there is the debate about patenting versus keeping something a trade secret versus publicly disclosing it and allowing everyone to build off of what you're creating. Okay, so in the patent world, you've got two different kinds. So a utility patent is basically what protects the functionality of a product. So you're talking about a Starbucks coffee maker that actually functionally makes the drinks, okay? The utility aspect of something. A design patent protects only the design, and it's like a death sentence if part of that design is functional. It can't be functional. It has to purely be ornamental. So when you're looking at any kind of uh, jewelry, like I, I worked with um, on Brighton. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the name brand. I wasn't until I was there, and they have all this jewelry, right? And we're looking at 18 million design patents on hearts because one has a swoop here and one doesn't. And that makes a difference, right? Whether or not you're infringing someone else's design patent. Um, right now we're going through a pretty intense analysis of children's wagons, like pull wagons, because some exist out there that have patents on them and our client is creating a new one, right? So they have to make sure that whatever they are building it is not going to be infringing on anything that already exists in this other wagon that has patent rights. 
but they also have design patents on them, right? So that's purely the look of it rather than the functionality. And then you also have two, two options when you're filing a utility patent. Design patents do not have these options. A design patent you file and you file it when you're ready to file it. A utility patent, you have two options. You can file a provisional patent or a non-provisional patent. A provisional patent is like a placeholder. You're basically saying, hey, this is our general idea. This is what we think that we're inventing. And now you have one year to tinker with what you're creating to basically recreate, you know, whatever it is that you, if you want to add something on to what you're creating or develop it further, you have a full year before then you have to file a non-provisional. The non-provisional, which is an option at the beginning to just go straight for the non-provisional, is just what would turn into a registered patent. That is what gets examined by the patent examiner. They will not examine a provisional patent. So you have to transfer a provisional patent into a non-provisional in order for it to then ever become a registered patent. Initially, if you file a provisional or a non-provisional or a design patent, you can say patent pending. That in and of itself has been a reason that clients will file for a patent. The marketing, you know, that, that the marketing edge that that gives you, um, the you know sophistication that that can present to whether you're looking to be acquired, have VCs take a look at what you're doing, or simply, you know, like I said, have that really sparkly feature in, in the media, right? Or or what have you in the marketing plans to say, oh, we're patent pending on something, you know, and it makes it seem new and fancy, which it is. Um, that one year, let's see if I talk about that again. I'm not sure that I do. Oh, I do in the process, maybe. It, it is important to note that, yes, you have that one year, right, to tinker with something if you're filing a non-provisional before it becomes, or the provisional, before it becomes a non-provisional. However, there's also a one year on sale bar. And what that is, is basically the minute that you have publicly disclosed, and it's a legal term, so there's a lot of things that could be public disclosure. Uh, but once you've publicly disclosed your invention, then you have one year before you lose the ability to file for a patent on it. So, you know, we've had clients come to us with, oh, yeah, how about, you know, our beach blanket? Can we? because they've got this brand new bamboo fancy way of doing a beach blanket. Like, can we get that patented? And I'm like, yeah, that would be great. But how long has it been, you know, out there, right, for sale? And it's been two years. So they lost the ability then to claim any rights to that specifically, because now it's just been in the public disclosure and, and they lose the ability to do that. Uh -huh. What's an example of public disclosure? Like having a website, having social media about it? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So there's several things to consider. The first most important thing to consider is whether or not somebody could recreate what you've created through the disclosure. So I say that because, you know, if you're simply using, uh, creating something that then is kind of internal to the business. Let's say it's a security geofencing that's used in banking, okay? And no competitor, no client, nobody knows how it's done, right? But this is something that the company has done internally. And you have uh, documents, namely employee agreements, non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements, all of that with anyone that kind of would have any knowledge of this particular technology, then that would not be considered public disclosure, even if you've been using it for, let's say, the past three years at the company. The reason being because you've done a good job of making sure that it's not publicly disclosed 
Um, if for some reason, on the other side of that, you have exposed to your clients what it is, how it works, because it gave you that marketing edge to win their business, and they do understand how it works and how, how it operates, that could be considered a public disclosure. So later, in, in really this only ever comes up when you're dealing with a lawsuit, right? An infringement lawsuit when either you're trying to enforce your rights against a competitor or they're trying to enforce their rights or get you to basically to invalidate your rights to say, oh no, we can do this too because they don't actually have the right to, to keep us from doing it, right? They publicly disclosed this a long time ago. That's when that would come up. And so taking those measures to make sure that it is protected would be great. If you are selling a product and it's a new product that you've created, yeah, if it's been on a website and for sale, then you're gonna be limited to that one year from the date of, of sale or exposure of the product to, to the community as a whole, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's tricky because, you know, sometimes too, as people are developing new technologies and new products, they wanna have conversations with potential business partners to say, you know, hey, can you help us develop this? Can you help? And they don't want to lose, you know, they don't want to start their time. They don't want to start the clock yet. And so we're very good about making sure they've got strong non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality agreements with whoever they're having these conversations with, right? To basically say, in that agreement itself, this is not a public disclosure, right? We are simply having conversations about collectively creating intellectual property, you know, building out this technology further, that type of a thing. Because it can be, you know, if you take a work in progress to a convention, something like that, where you want to display part of it, that has sunk a case that I've been on before. That alone was enough for the other side to say that was a public disclosure and it predated their, I mean, it gave them five months that they were like out of that window. No longer then could they say they had the patent rights to it. No longer could they say this competitor could not create what they were creating. So this is kind of a fun, um, a fun page. I like this because I pulled these up and it's got the original iPhone patent. Um, and the magnetic levitation for a train, which is used a lot in, the, in Europe. Uh, the, the exoskeleton enabling people to walk again. The quadcopter drone, right? Who would have thought in 1962 that somebody had, had filed that, that patent? 3D printer uh, that was, uh, patent was filed in 1986. And a lot of this is really to show that you know, it's a really good idea at the start of the process of creating something new to do a patentability search. And this is whether or not you have made, <laughs> I call it the moral choice, about whether you want to have something publicly disclosed and not get any patent rights on it and just let other people build on it, right? And just have it out there in the world to make the world a better place and to incentivize more technology creation. Uh, whether you've done that or decided that you want to monetize this, license it, take that market share hold for the next 20 years. Either way, if you are creating something that requires a license, right, that's, that is infringing on someone else's patent right now, then that means, you know, you're, you're going to walk yourself into an infringement lawsuit and be stopped at the start no matter what. So kind of regardless of which way you wanna go, if you are kind of developing this new technology, this, this patentability search is key. It really is to know what's out there, to know kind of the, the scope, I'd say, of, of what you can do now or what isn't yet protected. Um, patentable subject matter is kind of the first step, right? Knowing that you have Let's say you do want to make, you do want to see, you know, the ability to monetize what you've created and you want to get licenses on it and 
the first step then is going to be looking at whether what you've created is useful, novel, and non-obvious, which means the non-obvious part is tough. That one, we get a lot of office actions, which is like a first rejection from the patent examiners on that specific piece of something being non-obvious because it's really, it's easy for them to say, well, you should have, you know, if you're gonna make a floating dock based off of like pontoon boats, right? So this is like a marina dock and you're gonna make it off of what you see on pontoon boats and how they operate functionally on the bottom. And now you're gonna apply that to docks, right? And they're like, well, yeah, I mean, why wouldn't you? Someone that sees boats all the time is probably automatically gonna, it's not obvious or it's obvious to them that they would take that and they put it underneath the dock and make the dock float that way, right? That's pretty obvious. So we get, we get a lot of rejections like that that then force us as attorneys to say, then why hasn't it been invented yet, right? Like that's the logical argument. Then why hasn't somebody else done this? So you have to kind of take these steps to say, no, it is not obvious because, you know, boats also require propellers and movement, like who knows how that's affecting, the velocity is affecting the floating ability versus something that's just sitting there, you know, on the water and, Truly, it is helpful to be able to say, but it doesn't exist yet, right? And some of the most brilliant inventions, as we all know, are some of the most simple. Um, let's see. So then you, you think about whether or not you have sold something, right? Or made a public disclosure. Then you can file your provisional or non-provisional and wait your year to finalize the product and go through the examination phase. Then if you do get a patent registered to you, then you want to protect that, right? And make sure that you have mechanisms in place internally in your company to protect that, um, as well as then you can license this product. We do have several clients that license to competitors because it allows them they have a marketplace, but for them, market share wasn't sufficient and, and a competitor was gaining ground in what they were doing, but it wasn't as good as what our client had because our client had the patent on it. And they said, you know what, we're gonna license what we've created to them because they're really good at what they do in terms of marketing. They have a great client base. Let's get some of their money. Let's get some of their revenue coming and then they'll license to them. Keep in mind again, right? You're only talking about this 15 to 20 year mark. Right. Yeah, yeah, whenever you, what do you want to shoot it. Um, what, so you're talking about the facilities, right? So we- No, I'm just talking- Yeah, or I'm what just, they offer. What yeah, they offer. Yeah, yeah. So we could do, um, I'm thinking like where- Hey, Doc. Sorry, my- No worries. <laughs> I was like, you're not on mute. <laughs> Sorry about I'm muting now, sorry. Okay, no, it's all good. <laughs> okay, I just figured they're probably gonna have like this long in depth conversation that we probably don't need to be privy to. <laughs> um, okay, now let's go into this, this debate, right, about the patent versus a trade secret. So this is another way to go instead of, you know, spending the time and money to patent something, you don't decide to do that and you want to instead make something a trade secret knowing that the moment that you patent something, right, it's publicly available for everyone to see and to recreate themselves, potentially. Um, at least, you know, they're supposed to wait for those 20 years. But if you don't really have the backing and the funds to protect the patent that you have gotten, I would say it's tough. It's a tough decision. Because really, if you don't have that backing to protect the patent that you got, then you should probably think about just going the trade secret route. Because you don't know what other people are gonna do and infringement happens all the time. But if you don't have the ability to spend the money on you know, people like me and IP attorneys that are gonna fight for you, which it's expensive, just the legal system is expensive, right? filing a complaint, taking the time to make your arguments. Like nothing is fast. 
and you're going to be losing revenue because of this competitor that's entered the space, even if they are infringing. So it's, it's a business decision and it's an important one to make at the outset of, wait, am I better positioned right now instead to just keep this a trade secret, which means that nobody knows about it. It's not publicly disclosed, right? You, you have to paper it though very well because under the law, there's very specific requirements in order to call something a trade secret. So, you know, you work with a business attorney to have these things written out that basically say, you know, all employees, um, any independent contractors, anyone that you're working with, you identify what is the trade secret, you call it out as that, and you have very strong confidentiality clauses around that particular technology. And you just try to make sure nothing leaks, you know, that people can't reverse engineer what you've created and, and you know, fingers crossed, right? And that's kind of that route. Um, if for some reason something does happen where somebody leaves your company, goes to work for another company, and all of a sudden, right, there's your product. Um, oh, they have this component and it's exactly, you know, our product. That does happen all the time. And there's a trademark or a, a trade secret statute that's in place for you, right, to use in, in terms of going after someone that then has violated that trade secret and allowed another company to basically use you know, what you've created. So there's mechanisms. It's not like if you don't get a patent, you have no way to enforce or fight for what you've created. There are ways in which you could still fight for that. And then the patent versus the copyright um, <laughs> versus trade secrets. So this conversation is more about software, right? So when we're talking about software, most often any patent attorney you talk to is gonna say, oh, software patents, like you can't get a software patent, right? And that's basically true at the outset. And that's because there was some really intense like bad, bad law in terms of being, you know, a software developer that wants to get patent rights. Um, that, you know, it's so, basically, if you think about the reason behind patents, right, fundamentally, it's because they want to give society, right, an incentive to create, an incentive to create new technology that will benefit society as a whole. So they say, okay, great. This is your incentive. You get these 20 years, right? You get these 20 years, you get to have market share. You're gonna make as much money as you want to on this particular thing, right? And that's, that's the goal. Well, where is that if, you know, software is, is so rampant and prevalent and we're talking about something that has to be novel, right? And it's like, at what point is every tiny little thing then a difference, you know, that makes it then novel? So software patents are tough to get. I will say that. However, there's been traction recently. Now we're starting to see more, more software patents again. And it's because we are disrupting that space again. There's new and novel things that are being done with software that's making it Eight, you know, making these people able to get patents again. So that being said, you can also get a copyright on software, right? Because it's a tangible code. We'll talk about copyrights in a second. But that being said, you're looking at, okay, well, a copyright. What's the difference there? You're not looking at this 20 year timeline. A copyright, you've got 70 plus years after the death of the author. So the protection is a lot longer it's also much easier to do damages under the copyright statute um, because there's specific numbers on the damages in, in that statute than for patent law, right? In terms of patents, if you're trying to protect yourself or get damages, you have to prove the damages that you've suffered. So if some, it's really easy if you have a product and a competitor has sold like you know, 500 units of the, of the product, right? That's easy to quantify, but it's not always that simple, right? If it's if it's a technology that's like behind the scenes of a, of a company or something and you're not talking about a product, then you're gonna have a more difficult time proving that out. So 
that's kind of the, the argument there is just, you know, thinking about what's best for you and your company and your goals going forward. No patent at all. So this is kind of an interesting, I, I love to bring this up because a lot of people were not aware of this. Maybe they've done better in the media recently, but with the COVID-19 vaccine, um, there were several companies that entered into an IP sharing agreement, such as Pfizer, Moderna, Oxford, et cetera. And they all agreed to share the IP surrounding these discoveries. This was obviously done, right, for the benefit of society and thinking that nobody needs to be profiting, right, off of what's going to be better for the general good. So I, I know a lot of, I, you know, our geeky IP attorney conversations were like, this is so great to see, right? Gives us such good faith in humanity that they were doing this. So that is a consideration as companies are built is whether you are creating something that you would prefer it just be out there in existence for everyone to see and build upon immediately, not take that 20 years to yourself um, and basically make your money a different way, right? Just be the best at it. Um, be first to market, have the best marketing, all of those, those things. Um, I have a client right now that is developing, oh, just a mind blowing technology that it's one of those things where you sit there and you go, oh my gosh, like I, I can't even wrap my mind around this because it doesn't exist yet, right? It's very hard to contemplate, but they're doing this without seeking any patent protection whatsoever. And their idea is to get this particular technology to all of the underdeveloped countries of the world to get them back on the playing field in terms of leveling the playing field with other countries that are more developed. So, um, you know, he's a big supporter of Tom's and like all these other companies, right, that are giving back and he loves that idea, but this is his way of giving back. He doesn't want any patent protection on it and wants to ensure that it's accessible to everyone and for other people to start building off of it right away. So just something to consider. It's an interesting conversation. Um, so, yeah, the societal value of disclosure versus your market share. Okay, so let's do a patent searching breakout session so that we can take a look at some utility and design patents. Um, I'm going to end my show real quick. The easiest way, so we do have as attorneys something that you can get into called PAIR that allows you to like really research, you know, very specifically similar to the trademark search, right, in terms of what's available at the United States Patent Office. However, that being said, for most of my clients, I even tell them still initially just go to Google Patents because they also, it's a great user-friendly interface um, that allows you the ability to take a look and research patents that are out there. And it's, like I said, it's user-friendly. So you just go to Google Patents and let's see, it's actually patents.google.com in terms of the, what you're putting in the search bar. Okay, so I was going to have us look up the California Beach Company. And here, when you're searching, it is very similar to a normal Google operation, right? So you can put in here either, in quotations, the name, if you want to know if a company that has products out there, if they have something patented, you can put in the name of the company. You can put in, you know, quotes, coffee machine quotes umbrella, which we're going to do in a minute. But here, let's start with this company name. So the California Beach Co. in quotes, and you search, and you'll see this one come up. So click on the portable playpen. And if you want a particular view of what actually the the patent itself is going to look like, you would download the PDF. And this is a 
design patent. And the way you know that is up here in this right hand corner, you see patent number US D 880172. That D is for design. And it gives you the date of the patent that it was issued. That's not when it was applied for, but that's when it was issued. And you've got the name of it. You always name the patent. You have several things that go into the creation of a patent that all become relevant, such as the applicant who's filing for the patent versus the inventors. So in any company, let's say it's a much larger company, right? You're gonna have the ownership of whatever's being created under you assigned to the company. And this is important if you're working with independent contractors, because in an independent contractor agreement, you need to have them assigning any rights to any IP that they are creating to your business, because the law automatically assumes that they own whatever rights they're creating. So you'll have several different inventors. Usually you'll have a lot of people listed, but that doesn't mean that they own it. They're just listed as inventors. Um, sometimes the assignee will be different than the applicant. So often there can be an IP holdings company. Um, if businesses want to hold all of their intellectual property in a specific LLC, apart from whatever else they have going on with the business, that's a strategic move so that if they are sued, all of the IP assets are in one place. And so let's say assets, you know, from other parts of the business, et cetera, are in another entity. And so they'll keep the IP in one entity. You'll see the term is 15 years. Okay, let's get to the good stuff, right? In a design patent, the claim is only ever going to say this, right? The ornamental design for, and then whatever it is, a teapot. A, a necklace, a heart, this is a playpen and shown as described. And then here, this description and these figures showing all different angles of this particular playpen is what's claimed. So you can see it's what you see exactly as it is here. And even the shape of the door being a U shape Let's say this was a circle. That person could also then probably file a design patent without any issues because of that slight difference in the design. Uh -huh. So if somebody else tried to recreate it with like a square shaped store, could they do that? Yeah. There are several different patents on this baby playpen design owned by various people. Mm -hmm. And it's all because even the posts Right? If there's less than six posts coming out of the top, that's a des different design feature. If the top is netted instead of having it open, that's a new design feature. So even if nobody had filed a patent and it was the exact same except for the door, like mm -hmm. it's everything's the same except for the door and this new person doesn't have a patent, they're fine, they're not breaking any laws. I mean, that depends on who you're talking to, right? Because the client that owns this is gonna say, no, you're infringing. This looks close enough, right? And they're gonna try to argue that it is infringing on this. Um, in terms of our analysis, right, as attorneys, when they say, hey, you know, cause we'll get shot different knockoffs all the time. Hey, is this infringing? Is this infringing? And then you take a look and you have to sincerely say, you know, it's not worth it. Like you would lose this battle, right? Because the door is that much different that yes, they, they've gotten around to our patent, which is why it's a good idea, especially if you have a product like this, where there's features here, obviously that are functional, right? These poles are functional, the pop-up mechanism, the way the poles are, right? This seems like it's ripe for both a design patent and a utility patent. Right, and then you'd have protection over both. Um, and there's the back, and you've got kind of all sides, so the sides of it, 
And you know, CAD drawings are typically the best thing that you can give to your patent attorney um, to help them you know, with, there's drafters, there's patent drafters that are doing this, right? And, and making these images. Um, but the best thing you can do for sure is to have these CAD drawings available. Okay, so we'll go back out of here. And the description just tells you what each, you know, each view is, each figure is of the product itself. And when you come down to patent citations, as you can see here, there's a long list. These are all, what you have to do with the patent office when you apply for a patent is give them what's called prior art. It's basically anything that you think is somewhat similar to what you've created, but isn't the same, right? This is somewhat similar, but we're different. But you, ha you have a duty to actually disclose this prior art to the patent office when you are applying. But let's pull up one of these just to see, you know, the difference, right? So protective play enclosure, let's try this. You can see automatically how different this is, right? With these images. And this is also a utility patent rather than a design patent. And the way that you know that is because the claims, right? It's not claiming the ornamental design of, right? This is claiming actually what it is. A protective play enclosure, enclosure comprising and then it'll give you, I mean, the way that patents are worded is just, it's such a different language um, for everyone, you know, and, and patent attorneys uh, <laughs> have to explain to judges, most judges were not patent attorneys. So when you're going into court, right, and you have to actually explain what any of this means, you're, you're obviously telling, you know, the jury of normal people like you and me what any of this means. And you're also trying to explain it to the judge. It is it is difficult to understand the language in which patents are written, like just from the get go. And so, you know, often people will try to maybe draft their own. It's great because it's helpful for patent attorneys to see what the inventors view as like the novel aspects. But truly, it's such an art and such a nuance that. I feel like people are at a disadvantage if they don't allow a patent prosecutor to, to do this work, to pay a patent prosecutor to do the work. Um, and that's not me. I'm a litigator and I'm a strategist, but I don't write the patents. That's even a separate bar exam that people have to take to be a patent drafter. So it's, it's interesting. And most of them have a background in engineering or, or you know, some sort of science background that has to do with biomechanics, yeah. This might be kind of a cynical view, but like, why would someone even patent something like this one that we're looking at if yeah. it's so easy to infringe upon? Oh. Just by changing one tiny aspect. In terms of the design patent, is that what you're talking about? The last one we're looking at, yes. Okay, yeah, so you're but, saying if it was a utility patent, it would have been much harder? Yes, Okay. it would. So this is, is why. Um, this is a client of mine and we do probably 10 to 15 takedowns off of social media of knockoffs a week. So what this does by having a patent, it gives us as attorneys the tools that we need to then go online with Facebook, with Instagram, with um, Shopify, because they um, basically they allow people to create new websites to sell things, right? So we go on there or Alibaba, Amazon, they have mechanisms for uh, owners of intellectual property to put in like whatever IP it is that they own. So whether it's the trademark, uh, whether it's the copyright of the images that they've taken, right, to like promote and sell their stuff, or a patent, and you can put it into their system and do a takedown request. And that third party that's like hosting something that is claimed to be infringing 
has to take them down, has to respond, or then they are also liable for the infringement. So they are happy to comply with our requests. But that is why. Yep. So it's it's a more, it's like a broader business discussion, right? With like other um, you know facets, I guess, like other um, components that you don't necessarily think of when you're just straight thinking, you know, am I going to be able, because obviously they're not going to monetize this, like they're not going to license this out to other people, right? But it does become a tool for them, you know, and, and, and a bargaining chip as well. Um, they, you know, have competitors that have patents as well. And if they can negotiate with them to say, you know, well, we'll take this license from you or we'll have this patent signed to us and then we won't sue you anymore, right? Or things like that. I mean, it, it just becomes kind of a bargaining chip. It just becomes something else that, another right that you have that then, yeah, it can't come into play. But I, I agree with you. It's it's tough to see that uh, that angle all the time when, especially with design patents, when they only go so far. Okay, so now let's look at, this I think is kind of fun. We're just gonna do umbrella um, to look at some easy utility patents because utility patents can be pretty daunting with the number of claims that they have, et cetera. Let's look at this backpack with an integral umbrella. So here's their, these are their images, right? And these are all things that are being discussed. These are all figures that are being discussed later. So these are all part of the patents that are protected here. So what is being claimed is a backpack comprising a deployable umbrella, further comprising, and it just kind of goes on, right? And this is all claim one, all of this language here where it talks about all of these items that has secret storage and a release mechanism housing an umbrella. Now, if we were to create a backpack that just had this secret storage space without the umbrella coming out of it, you could not, with the way that this is written, this particular patent, you could not be infringing this patent because in this first claim, they include the umbrella coming out of it. So because of that, because it's within the same claim, then that allows people the ability to do this backpack with this particular, you know, just hidden storage and you wouldn't be infringing on this patent. So it's not very well written, is what I'm trying to say. Um, if you were to write this in a way where you have sort of the backpack with a de deployable umbrella, yada, yada, but you had a separate claim that talked about the backpack with the secret storage as you know, moving on, dependent of this first claim, then you've broadened the scope of the patent to include backpacks that also have a storage compartment on them. So it gets real deep, it gets nitty gritty, but it's kind of nice to have this background and exposure and kind of, you know, see what, what this is all about because it's kind of a whole world in and of itself that's very, uh, very different than anything else, you know, that we normally read or understand. And this has, let's see, 16 claims, even just for this very simple backpack, right? And that's that's a very simple utility patent for sure. Um, do we have anything else? We looked at that. Oh, okay. Yes, this would be fun. So I'm going to do Starbucks now just because this will show you how complicated they can be. So this is a much more complicated patent that has 
several views and their different figures. Um, and several, like within the figures, right, you get real deep, right? So this is, you can see here, you're looking at some of the internal components in this beverage dispenser and how they operate and it's all being claimed. Okay, so they've got, they talk, again, there's always gonna be sort of this abstract about what it actually is, what the invention is, and then you get much more detailed when you actually look at the language of the claims and what, what they're trying to claim as the invention. But it is not super simple. Here they show, they go through every single figure and discuss what it does in this system and how it operates and how it's a part of it. So anyway, that's a much more complicated version of a utility patent. Okay, we'll get back to running here. Do you guys have any questions about patent searching or the design utility aspect or anything? Yeah. What about the utility of something really basic, like a straw? Mm -hmm. Like if, so I have a product that uses a straw in it, like would I need to file a utility patent on that? Since it seems like that's super obvious, I don't think it, is there a patent on a straw. Right, I would, I would agree that that's likely in um, the public domain, right? That that's passed if there was. Um, it's an interesting, you know, project. Let's just check it out. I'm gonna go back to Google Patents. Do straw. I'm sure there's probably several on different types of straws as well. You've got all kinds of all kinds of things that come up. And you might want to, so because of this, there's a hundred thousand. If you're talking about drinking straw, right, you can add that into your search. Filtered drinking straw, beverage container or lid with a drinking straw, novelty drinking straw with a flow regulator. <laughs> so it's really interesting, right, once you get in here and try to figure out what, what exists and what doesn't. But this is provided as a straw. So these are very specific. Right. And these have obviously mechanisms within them. You know, this is not just a tube in water or other liquid. There's definitely specific mechanisms within it. And so this control ball, my guess is this has got to be for like some kind of therapy maybe, or like controlling the, how fast the flow is something like that. Um, usually you can find somewhere in the summary, you know, something where it talks about specifically what the purpose is of the invention. Um, but yeah, it seemingly what you're talking about is just going to be in the public domain and has no you know, specific rights to it unless it's obviously got some novel aspect to the draw piece, the straw piece. But however, you know, even if you are creating something new and there's components of it, right, that are not necessarily novel, that's, it's just, we'll get into copyrights, but it's kind of just like copyright law where you basically are saying, you know, we're not claiming anything having to do with that. We're claiming this piece of it. So there can simply be, so in my doc example earlier, right, with the pontoon element, if there's already some sort of a patent on like the floating device of a pontoon and how that particularly works, however it's applied to let's say boat docks, like that in and of itself, whatever that difference is, that is what could be potentially patentable and protectable. But just having it, you know, in and of itself, right? It, it wouldn't necessarily be. So that could be, yeah. That can be the case for sure. Okay, so these were kind of the keynotes. Oh, you always wanna mark your products with the patent number if you receive a patent. Huge, 
huge no because you're putting others on notice of the fact that you have a patent. Or if you have a patent pending, again, you also want to say patent pending. It just allows you then, if you are in any kind of an infringement lawsuit later, to be able to claim damages earlier because the moment somebody received the product, they have were on notice of what your patent is or your potential um, for the patent pending. And these are those one-year deadlines. Huge to remember those because most startups, again, you know, if you are thinking that you want to go the patent route and you have an idea for strategizing, monetizing, licensing, and you want to get a patent, or you just want to have your name on a patent, and that just seems really awesome and fascinating in and of itself, and you want to go that route, um, it is so important to remember that one year deadline from disclosure. Um, people get too wrapped up in, you know, I don't have the money right now, and I can't protect it now, or we don't have it perfect yet, right? And remember, you have that year, even if you file that provisionally, you have that year to tinker with it. Um, and the other piece of all of this is just to, you know, also give you an understanding that it is not always $20,000 to get a patent either. Um, like a design patent, like what we just looked at, would run like 2,500 at a place like like a smaller boutique type IP firm, right? And so it's it's possible in, in the utility patents, same way, I mean, if you're looking at that Starbucks patent, yes, you're gonna be spending $20,000. It's very complicated. It's got a lot going on. You have to really get into, you know, a lot of technical aspects. If it is not necessarily that complicated, like we have utility patents on cone hooks, even that some clients have and things like that, that can be similarly priced in like the four to six thousand dollar range rather than like the twenty thousand dollars. Yes, there's always going to be the fees that you're paying to the office and things like that. But generally speaking, you know, it's not necessarily um, as crazy as you think. And if you are seeking acquisition or looking to get angel funding or VC funding, they love to hear that you're even thinking about patents because it gives you, you know, that sophistication, the, the, the education. Um, they know that you're already thinking about the fact that, that you can't infringe on someone else. So therefore, if they invest in you, you're a lower risk than they're otherwise thinking, right? And that's important when people are trying to spend money on things and invest in people. They want to know that, you know, the risk is lower um, in terms of what they're they're looking at. So anyway, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, okay, copyrights. So as we touched on with David Bowie, um, which I just I just love that. And like the Marvin Gaye case was also a big case. Like the music is is obviously more fun in the copyright world than anything else, but you are still looking at, also, you know, images, your entire website can be copyrighted. The look and feel of things is kind of what you're thinking about, right? Any written content. So the moment that you are typing anything, um, we used to laugh in law school because we we're like, oh, so our outlines are copyrightable. <laughs> you know, here, anything that you are tangibly creating, software, um, and you are, you have the exclusive right to produce it and make copies of it if you have um, if you have the patent rights to it. And one of the biggest problems with copyright law that people just don't understand is that you cannot enforce a copyright until you have it registered with the copyright office. Um, just it's just part of the statute. And it's the cheapest form of protection. It's like a $55 filing fee uh, and minimal, I'd say minimal attorney time in terms of the filing of the application and everything. Um, and so it's worth it to do it at the time, right? As you're building a, a business and thinking about, you know, even if let's say you're like a business coach and you have amazing materials, you know, that you give to your clients and you have these workbooks that are great, or you know you think your website is, is completely stellar and people are likely to 
go on and copy some of the content you've got or the look and feel of your app. If you've created an app, you can copyright an entire app. Um, it's that alternative to the, the patenting side, right? When there's not another way to protect this medium, try to think outside the box and think if maybe it could be copyrighted. Um, the design of, of something has to be separable from the item. If you're talking about like fashion and things like that, um, there's a great case about cheerleader uniforms um, and the, basically the design that they created on these uniforms was protectable because it, it wasn't just functional, right, on these uniforms. It's actually a design that someone has created. And then the biggest reason why copyrights are so helpful in terms of any business that is using social media or photographs or videos to market their services or products is this takedown ability. And that's through the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and that's that, what I just went through, that whole scenario with the design patent, right? So Amazon, Facebook, Instagram, eBay, anybody that's, you know, big out, any, any website provider as well, um, that you go out to and you, you can note, we own copyright X. You can give them the registration. You can show them the photo that you have registered. They can take down anyone that is a copycat um, or you know has a lookalike product, um, a gray good, which is something that if you have a, a manufacturer in China, often, and I, I will say often, um, the manufacturer will start to produce your product on the side, selling it to another distributor, and you will find your product being sold on Alibaba or on Amazon by someone else and for sure it's your product, like actually your product. And it is because it came from the same manufacturer and that's called a gray good because it's not a knockoff. It's not a, it's not a um, counterfeit where it's a different manufacturer that's making a similar product. It's truly the same product. But anyway, those are all mechanisms and copyright helps us have tools to be able to fight that for you, for, for your business. Uh, some of the things to look out for with, with copyright, and I, I really like to talk about the software component because I feel like so many things that are coming out and being invented um, are using open source technology. And it is so important to look at those terms of service uh, because that is where you will find some of these loopholes where you, know, you cannot use something for commercial gain that you've created using their open source code at all. And that's a big problem. Or they can own whatever you've created. So I had a client create an app, um, loved it, you know, used an independent contractor. That independent contractor, funny enough, would not sign an agreement warranting his work. You know, I'm basically saying, Yes, this is all you know code that I've written. Da, da, da. We're like, why? What is that? Turns out he had used a lot of open source code, never reviewed the terms of service of, of it. He had used some specific Microsoft code in there. Microsoft owned this guy's app, like full stop. And he ended up having to turn it over and give them all the money that he had gotten. Um, yeah. So war stories, right? But all the more reason to, to take a look at those terms of service. Um, clothing, the functional aspects cannot be protected. So you have to make sure that it's not, you know, you, you can see, and again, I go back to this fly fishing, but that, that's because I, I like fly fishing and I, I talk about it a lot. But anyway, if you have like a shirt that has like all these components and patches and, you know, things like that, and it's like, well, is that just for design or is that functional, right? You kind of run into this um, kind of murky world and you have to make your arguments to the, the United States Copyright Office when you do your application. Um, videos, images, things like that. Um, Non-copyrightable content that may be owned by someone else can be disclaimed. Like let's say your website hosts posts or things like that from other people you can simply copyright what is yours. 
and disclaim things that are not yours. Um, same thing in terms of the content you've created that has open source in it. You can still get a copyright on what you've created while disclaiming whatever open source it was that you utilized, as long as you're in compliance with their terms of service. Um, and of course, making sure the company owns the created content. So often, especially with you know developing new software or apps and things like that, people will use their friends. They'll team up with somebody. Um, they'll you know hire someone to develop something for them, but they never really have an agreement in place. And they're like, oh, we talked about it. It's fine. They're helping me build this. Well they're gonna own anything that they're building. So unless you have an agreement in place that basically says, right, that anything that's being created goes to the company and people, you know, I'm always like, just blame it on the lawyers. Be like, oh, it's a terrible lawyer. It just makes me, you know, like have everything in writing and says that we have to do this. And, you know, it's so over the top, but whatever, you know, blame me. I'm like, Always make the lawyer the bad guy, but get something in writing. Even if it's an email that's like, hey, we both agree we're going to open blank blank LLC and anything we're creating is going to be owned by blank blank LLC. That will be the first piece of evidence in any argument down the line, for sure. So even if it's as simple as that, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. So even with like content, like I have friends who will make me like an infographic or something. Mm -hmm. Do I have to have some like, would their only recourse be to have me take that down off my Instagram or could they like get profits from that? Great question. So that is something that they then own a copyright in. So there's a statutory damage clause in the Copyright Act where they can basically ask for whatever that would be in the, in like, it starts at $250, $250 and goes up from there into the thousands. Um, it's all based on the facts. So if you are profiting or conceivably, you know, sales are being uh, led to via whatever it is that they've got going on, then yes, you can attribute some lost profits or like gains basically from you to them, but they normally, if they don't have it registered, A, if they don't have it registered, then they cannot get uh, the statutory damages. They have to go with actual damages. And that usually is much less. And it is very hard to prove okay. because you know you're trying to prove all these things. But again, it's like nobody wants to fight. You know, nobody wants that. Nobody wants someone trying to claim something later. You know that let's say, and I don't know what the context is, but if for some reason all of a sudden it's like what you've created booms and is worth quite a bit, and they can somehow make an argument that you know. What they did for you was like, you know, attracting customers and things like that. And then you get in a little bit more of a sticky mess and then you're ending up in a settlement agreement where you're at least paying them something and probably an attorney to defend you, et cetera. And so what I like to do is have everyone never be in any of these situations, right? That everyone has a document that before anybody can send a cease and desist letter or make a threat it's like, oh, no, no, here's this, right? We, we agreed to this. This is, you said I could use this, you said it was fine, and like I own the rights to it now that it's on my stuff. Or conversely, they can agree that basically you have a license to it and you give them, a, you know, attribution and say this is work by so-and-so, but they're giving you a license to put it on your website, you know, and then you could say it's for them, right? And that's your consideration. Mm -hmm. So these are just some fun infringement case notes. Um, iHeartMedia, uh, we represented them with some photographs. Um, 
And by the way, I can talk about the things that I do talk about because they're public knowledge, just as my, my wonderful disclaimer as an attorney, right? Um, but anything that's, you know, all, all lawsuits and all of that are public. So people can go in and look, unless there's certain pieces of it that are filed under uh, confidentiality, then anybody can go in and see basically all the pleadings in all these cases. Uh, but they had displayed photos that someone else, like a you know another agency had given to them and they had the rights to it because they had some photographers sign away rights at the door to say, yes, you can photograph our event, but we own all the photos. Said photographer completely forgets, sues them three years later because he sees his photographs uh, all over the place promoting this event once, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damages because his photographs are in these places. And it's like, are you kidding? You've signed this agreement. And, you know, they're like, I know we did. I know we did. I just have to find it. I just have to find it. But it took a long time. It was like, I mean, literally this guy's parents lived in Tennessee, couldn't walk anymore. He had to fly back there, dig in the basement in these old buckets to like try to find this one document that this photo that this guy had, the photographer had signed. He found it. It's like, hallelujah, FedEx that puppy. You know, FedEx it, the case settled. It was like, this never should have happened. Like, how do you forget that you, you know, sign away rights to something? But such a huge ordeal for absolutely nothing. But the whole point there is, you know, he did sign something. There was a license, but record keeping, right? Like record keeping is key. And having things anymore that are just like always on some kind of a drive somewhere um, and keeping track of these emails that you have with friends and people that you're you know, working with and utilizing their time. Um, it's amazing, you know, as soon as money's on the table, a lot of people are no longer friends, just put it that way. So it's, it's important to, to get those conversations out of the way at the outset and keep track of them. Um, this is the, the Google versus Oracle case. Most people have tracked in some way or another, um, just because it's really interesting. Um, but basically, when you come down to it, the bottom line is, you know, there were the, just these lines of code that were used um, from, it, from this Oracle Java operating system. And Google could have licensed the code but they didn't. They tried to engineer around it, but they, they really couldn't. Like they had to include certain pieces and they basically just were like, well, it's only these few pieces, so it'll be fine. It was not fine. They figured it out and they sued them for a ton of money. And it's just, it's very interesting. But they, they, discern, they determined that it had been copyrighted and Google tried to say that it was fair use because it was only a certain number of them because fair use it's like the big defense in copyright law. But they didn't win, by the way. It was not fair use. Like when you're taking that chunk of code that actually has functional elements and you're just using it, like no, they just should have licensed it. It wasn't not fair use. Fair use is like what I'm doing today for sure. So educational purposes, right? I can like splash Google and Facebook up here all day long um, because I'm just teaching about them. Um, also, you are talking about the amount and substantiality of like taking something, right? So in terms of that case, right, 11,000 lines of code is not two lines of code, right? That's a, that's a difference. Um, and then, you know, what's that like the substantiality of it, right? Does it have functional element? Does it not? Um, a lot of times people will take maybe like a third of a picture you know, and then they have that like retransfigured into like a new piece of art. And you're, you're into this conversation about is that transformative? Is it not? Is it actually taking that, you know, using it? And the way that I like to think about it is, should the author only have been the one that could do that? Right? Should they have been the only one that could take that piece of whatever it was and make this new thing? Um, the nature of the copyrighted work matters. Um, there's there's more leeway with factual things rather than like something that's you know fully created new. Um, 
And you're talking about the market. Like, is this for income? Is it not? That's always a huge determining factor, right? Is, are, is this actually commercial in nature or is it not? And this is a funny note. So in the motion picture seven, there were all these copyrighted photographs in the film that were back on the wall in it. Um, and the owner of the photographs tried to sue the producer of the movie. Um, and the court held that they appeared fleetingly and were obscured and virtually unidentifiable. So they excused this as de minimis, which is another defense. It's like, oh, this is like so tiny. It is nobody knows what you're doing. Like they had no idea. No one could see what that was, right? Unless it had been this whole big thing, right, around these photographs and the movie had involved those photographs and, you know, then we would be in a different discussion, right, obviously. But it, it is kind of funny that that happened, I think. And then here's my, one of my last notes here, which is just jump into contracts real quick. I touched on them a lot, but non-disclosure agreements are my best friends because no matter what you're doing, if you think that at some point this could have something, like this could go somewhere. This could be a business relationship. This could be a new product. This could be an idea. Just have a non-disclosure agreement, right? Where both of you are saying, we agree not to disclose what we're talking about with other people without checking in with each other or, you know, it just, it really helps people keep their P's and Q's in line for sure, right? Um, which is which is really important. The ownership piece, like we talked about, making sure that anyone you're working with, if it's a friend or an independent contractor, anybody, they sign something that says the company owns what they're doing. Um, the independent contractor agreements, right? We talked about that. License agreements, that's how you monetize and control your intellectual property. Um, the master service agreements. So that's kind of what you have with vendors. You know, if you're gonna do products and things like that, that's where you're gonna go with that. And finally, reasons to protect your IP. Again, like I mentioned at the very beginning, it is the most valuable piece of the company often. And if it's stolen or replicated, you want to have a recourse, right? You want to give somebody like me the tools to be able to help you right, in terms of, of fighting for you. Um, you can monetize your invention with, with protecting your IP. You can provide yourself those tools to combat issues with distribution or counterfeits. Um, it can assist you with making sure that your minimum advertising pricing, like it can help you with pricing because you also can then use these IP tools in order to keep people above board and only able to sell your product at a certain price. The valuation sophistication of the company, like we talked about. And then it also can allow you these prophylactic measures. So sometimes like you were asking me about the design patents, another reason they did that is they have protection now all over the world because when you're, you can file something that gives you, it's a PCT application. And if they wanna be international, um, or protect themselves internationally, you can do that and file that and still have the first date of the United States patent be their first, their protection date, basically. So it gives you more protection worldwide. And, and that can be huge when you're talking about potential counterfeiters and things like that. And with, with physical products, it happens a lot. And that is all I have. But I really would love to answer questions or chat about anything else. So my question. Yeah. Um, so I saw a TikTok on your page. And uh -huh. this girl essentially posted a video of herself being a skincare or a character or two. Um, and there were comments on the bottom saying they saw videos or snippets of her video on another website essentially kind of selling her image. But she didn't produce. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, there's several layers there. I would say, you know, the first one is her right to publicity. 
So every human, right, has like your own right to publicity to allow people to post or repost images of you or not. So if she did not agree to that, A, she would have a right to publicity claim against whoever took her video and put it elsewhere. Um, B, the company that would be like basically saying that she's, you know, promoting their product and they're, and she's not, um, I would say that that's some kind of an unfair business practice. So it's like another claim that she would potentially have um, because, you know, they can't just take something that's out there for a different business, right? So, and that's, she would have standing because of the issue with, you know, her own image and likeness, but that other company would have standing as well to say, you know, you can't do that. There's also a false advertising claim to be made there because clearly she's not actually advertising for them and she'd be the one to, you know, testify to that aspect. Um, and, but most importantly, like you said, if there's, there's not a copyright necessarily on the video yet, because let's say it was just taken, right? She didn't go and file right away, right? Jump on the old copyright registration um, website and, and file that right away. You, like I said, the moment that you do something, you still have a copyright in it. And if she wanted to, right, that person could go on to, or the other company could go on to the infringing site and make a claim and basically say, like, be able to show them, you know, that she's the owner of it and make claim to it and request that it be taken down. We do that on YouTube all the time because people will take things and repost them and they're not allowed to do that. And so you claim ownership of it and then make that complaint. And everyone has, if you go into the terms of service or the privacy policy, they will have a place. I mean, they're guaranteed, they have to via the law. So hopefully they do, but they have a place where you can go in and make an IP claim, basically saying, you know, you have to take this down and then they'll take it down and then they'll let the parties figure it out. They will only put it back up if they get an okay from the original owner, the one that made the claim against the other person, unless you like file a lawsuit, which we've had to do because people have taken things down fraudulently before accident, like they've claimed that they owned a copyright in something and they didn't, and it was a Chinese counterfeit competitor. And so we had to actually file a, te you know, a temporary restraining order against that person and like get orders that Facebook and Instagram had to then you know, repost this stuff back up. So there's, yeah, but that's, that gives some, hopefully some clarity to that situation. So like the content that you post on social media, for TikTok, would it automatically get copyrighted as you yeah, I mean, it is, it's right. It's like the moment that it's created, you are the creator of it. So you then own the copyright technically always. It is always better to have a copyright and file it if you're gonna enforce it in court. But if you're just gonna be saying, I own this, this is me, this is mine. You don't necessarily have to have the registration to do that. You can just say that you own that and have those rights and demand that they take it down. Anything else? Any other? I've got some notes in the chat here. Let me see. Okay. Chris Coleman, sorry, this was like an hour ago. Oh no. And now he's gone, so he's not on here. But I'm gonna answer anyway, because hopefully he'll check this later. But he says it's probably too niche, but there are many cases of a patent or copyright to be filed defensively to assure something remains open source or freely available. Ah, interesting. Um, are there? There are not because um, basically you, you cannot like preemptively file for something yourself by then, how do I explain this? Um, like if the right were to exist and somebody, you know, files a patent or copyright, then they become the owner. So if then they wanted to, you know, allow others to do it without a license, then it just would become basically naked licensing of the patent rights 
and they just wouldn't be enforcing their patent. But no, that is not typically done. And I would say that's probably because, you know, it takes so much time and money and effort to go through the process, right, to protect something that, you know, why would you want to go and file for it, but then release it? Like you would just not file for it and then everybody could have access to it. Uh, is, is a much easier process or way to go about that. Um, but Chris, if you see this later, please email me if that was not an appropriate enough answer and you have further questions. Anybody else with other questions? Okay. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful and interesting and 